Welcome to the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author, Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator, Michelle Brigman. Come here weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Hi, I'm Fawn Germer. And I'm Michelle Brigman. And this is the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast. Today, our guest is Trish Lukasik, who is someone that has blazed unbelievable trail in the corporate environment and then confronted so many moral, ethical dilemmas in the workplace that she is one of my heroes. Some of this she can talk about freely, some she can't. What I can tell you about this is that I've known her a long time, and through that, I have had such a growing respect for this woman because she has courage and has set an example that all of us can only hope to emulate. So, Trish, welcome today. Thank you, Fawn. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be with you both. And I usually have people start and introduce themselves, and I I wanted to do that as a precursor, but I do want you to share the intro that you had for yourself. (laughs) <laughs> well, I like to describe myself as a as a businesswoman cat, uh, meaning I feel like I have nine lives in the business world, at least. I'm on number eight right now. So here's <laughs> hoping that this one sticks for a little bit because pretty soon I'll be at my end. But uh, But right now, I think I'm on my eighth life in business for sure. Well, and so tell what that means. And then, you know, you had such a meteoric rise. You have really gotten to the top. But define that in terms of kind of the companies and the level of work that you did. And then let's get real about what it has meant to you as a human being. For sure. So I like to describe my career journey as, um, you know, very twisting and turning. And that I think will come up a few times when we get into some of the meat, so to speak. And in a nutshell, I spent about two decades, no need to get into the gory details, in the largest consumer packaged goods companies in the world, including the Procter & Gamble Company, the Coca-Cola Company, and PepsiCo. And when I started in Procter & Gamble way back when, I thought this was kind of like a three-year decision. Who knew it would be a multi-decade decision? But uh, but the road and the path has been extraordinarily exciting and interesting, primarily because I think I never took, I I always took the road less traveled, let's say it that way, and we'll probably cover some of that. Um, Coming out of those multi-decades in, you know, Fortune 50 companies, I took an about face and I went into the world of startup and technology. I didn't understand anything about venture capital. I didn't know how to spell venture capital. Everyone I knew thought I had lost my mind, but I really wanted to go learn at the rate I had learned earlier in my career. And I hadn't been able to do that for a pretty long time because while the brand may change, the dynamic of the business might change a little bit, essentially the work was very similar. And so I took a major shift and went into um, a startup environment, which was the most significant change I think I could possibly imagine. I could not have imagined how much change that was. Um, And I did that for a bit. Then I went and and led a startup company for about a year, which was um, tumultuous at best. And today I work um, as an advisor, as an operating partner to um, a private equity firm and um, have the opportunity to go and work in all kinds of different businesses, all kinds of different capacities and all kinds of different um, sort of lifespans is where they are in their life cycle. And then I have the pleasure and the privilege of serving on two corporate boards as well. A very heavy hitter who is, when you see her in action, just has so much presence, has just the greatest image, just the embodiment of what you expect a major corporate CEO to be. And I, I fully expected that of you. And one thing that happened is you didn't like some of those rules. <laughs> so we got to talk about the get real story because it's, it's very inspiring and it's tough. This is a tough story. And I know that you've thought a lot about whether you want to share it, how you're going to share it. And I'm just grateful that you're making the effort because we all can learn a lot about it. So if you can talk a little about just the momentum in the beginning and, you know, you're racing up there and, and what does that do to your ego and what are you expecting? And 
First, I'd say, doesn't everyone need more friends like Fawn in their life? Yes, indeed. Check, check, yes, and check. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right, Michelle? Um, but let me talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I would say, first of all, it didn't always feel meteoric, although um, I do feel like I was very, very um, blessed, quite frankly, to have some great sponsors early on. And I want to talk about that for a minute because it matters. But I'm going to come back to that point in a second. Uh, what I'd say first is probably the, the lesson I learned earliest and that I share frequently um, with people, particularly people earlier in their career today is don't ever underestimate your 15 minutes of fame. And that might, fame might be a strong word, but however, whatever form that comes to it. And I'll share a quick story. I was at Procter & Gamble as very early in my career. And I was asked to lead this awards presentation for the finance organization. I was in finance at the time and I was super happy to do it because I happen to love a microphone and a stage. There are a few things that make me happier. So um, so I took this opportunity to present these awards. This was not a high stakes a, a, you know, thing at all. It was just a, an opportunity. Well, what happened is I didn't spit or stumble or trip over my words. I put full sentences together. And all of a sudden, there was this whole newfound interest in Trish Lukasik, Trish Evans at the time, um, right? Because I could actually hold my own in front of an audience. I didn't think anything of that. I have always loved public speaking. I was on the speech team, blah, blah, blah. But for me, that became a differentiator. And all of a sudden, different doors started opening for me just because of this little 20-minute presentation that I thought nothing of. So I, I use that as an example that, that came true several other times in my career where I was given an opportunity that I may not have even nailed it, but I didn't mess it up terribly. And it changed the trajectory because you build um, you build people, mentors who want to be part of your story when you can shine a little bit and, and then go shine is kind of my moral. So that's how it all started. Honestly, up until that point, I felt very sort of um, unnoticed, but all of a sudden this little presentation started this whole different conversation about my career and where it might go at PNG. And, um, and I wrote that and I learned very on early on that getting sponsorship and then trying to live up to the expectations and or exceed the expectations of those sponsors pays back all day long. So first of all, how early was that in your career when that moment happened? Oh, geez. I think I was 23, maybe 24. So I was maybe two years out of undergrad. Really soon. Well, so in, I think you hit on the point of sponsorship. And I think this is an area where a lot of women get confused. They think mentors you know, they're kind of over mentored, under sponsored. Can you spend a little bit of time just talking about what sponsorship really means and then how it Im impacted you in a little bit more detail? For sure. And I'm going to go back to that first experience because um, I think I can show it pretty clearly, right? So at that time, when I went into that role, that first role out of undergrad, um, I was the only undergrad student, kind of everybody else was coming out of their MBA. So they had more work experience than I. Um, it happened to be all men. I happened to be the only woman in that work group at the time. And um, those guys were became a band of brothers for me, for real. Um, they There were some really difficult things happening early on. And they became a band of brothers and really protected me. And they mentored me. That, But they did not have the political capital to sponsor me, right? They were essentially peers with a bit bigger paycheck because they had an MBA and a bit more experience. But so so they could, they were very helpful in terms of coaching um, and advice, but they, that's all they could give. And that's, that's valuable. And that's, and that's not valuable in the workplace, but sponsorship is that person who has some political capital and they can go and speak on your behalf and have other people take notice of you because they are saying, this is somebody we should watch. This is a hypo, if that's their vernacular, or this is someone who has great trajectory, whatever the terminology is in that organization. When you find someone who was willing to sponsor you, they will go into that room that you are not invited into on your own, and they will speak on your behalf and build your credibility. And I have found as my credibility got built through very powerful sponsors, my confidence built as well. And when those two things go together, that's when I think magic can happen in someone's career. And the magic did happen. It, it was, I just kept hearing about bigger and bigger jobs and you wound your way to Pepsi and at your pinnacle there, what were you doing? Um, my terminal role at PepsiCo, I was the chief customer officer for a $13 billion division of the business and all brands that I think everybody listening would know and love like Gatorade, Tropicana, Naked Juice, Astros, those were just sold off by PepsiCo. But at the time they were part of the portfolio. Um, Quaker, 
um, all kinds of businesses that were all businesses that were acquired over, over time at PepsiCo. And that role really entailed overseeing everything and anything that had to do with growing the top line. So every customer that we had in the United States, big or small, um, every new initiative we were launching, what the launch plan would be, what the pricing was going to look like, what the promotional strategy was going to be, all of the insights that go behind understanding our consumer and how to better reach them. That whole part of the business um, was kind of in my purview at that time. And so you were definitely in the sights of the CEO. So you were a player. I mean, so what does that do for your ego when you're you're there at the very top like that? And and at a time when Pepsi is getting a lot of attention for its leadership because they had a female CEO. Yeah, so that's a super interesting question. You know what I would say is um, there were there were incredibly interesting leaders, and at any organization, I think this would be true. Some were incredibly strong and very generous with their leadership, and some were not. But you learned a lot, and I probably learned the most from the bad leaders, maybe than from the best leaders sometimes, because you really think about what do I want to be when I grow up. I think what's probably the most interesting insight from my perspective is actually kind of reaching that highest level. My confidence was at its lowest, not at its highest. And that's a surprise, right? Because wow. you would think sort of you're getting recognized and rewarded to move forward um, at a pretty fast pace that you would think you're building your own confidence. But in that time and in that organization at that time, it was so competitive that um, what I had seen earlier in my career is, oh, I bet all those people at the top all get along and collaborate and like build big ideas together was not the reality. The reality was it was much more um, every man or woman or man for themselves and sort of make your own path and make your own mark. And a lot of angst um, between peer groups because, because that race to the top became very, very much of a pyramid at that point, right? So those that that job or those two or three jobs were so few that even if there were 25 of you vying for it, you had to win at someone else's expense. And that that was a pretty crushing blow from a confidence perspective. Um, it was also very lonely because you had very, very few people that you could actually trust and talk to about it. I'm, I'm really glad to hear you talk about some of this because it's the dirty little secret about the top of corporate world that particularly in that company, because I've known a number of people who this is what I'm about to say is not out of your mouth. It's out of somebody else who would tell me just the nasty things people would do in meetings and how they, you know, they would push themselves ahead and steal the narrative and, and the emails that were sent and the lies that were told. And I think, for what? If you have to do that to be at the top, why would you want to even be there? Yeah, you know, it was a it was a very unique culture, led by a brilliant woman. To be fair, an absolutely brilliant strategist, um, but the dynamic between peers and getting to that level was uh, difficult. It was just very difficult, and and there were it was known sort of who was in the circle because there were events that one might be invited to if they were sort of on the list. Um, and, and others would know, others in the circle would know who was invited to which event and who was not. And, um, and that was a pretty, um, I, would, I would argue, my opinion is that that was a pretty orchestrated um, situation to set up that competition. That was gonna, that's where I kind of, I was curious about because I think about, how much of this, and again, put any company here, because we've all seen elements of this, what, what you're, what you're describing is not unique, right? But is it, is it fueled for the competitive nature at the top to then have these people compete with each other for rank and power and control? Because as soon as that happens, the organization feels it and it has such a negative ripple effect downward. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out like if I'm sitting at the top of the pyramid, why would I ever want to look around at my team and see this type of behavior? Like what's the upside of that? I wish I could answer that question for you yeah. uh, because I struggled with the same thing. I would always say, I really did believe fundamentally, if we spent 50% as much time worrying about our external competitors 
as we did our internal competitors, we'd have been a wildly successful organization. Because metrics conflict, organizations are battling each other. You know, they're all, yes, we're all solving the same problem, but yet we're all, the way we're doing it is we're conflicting with one another. And it's just an interesting, it's interesting to see how long that can carry out because generally now, especially, you know, companies have to really rethink the culture and dynamics they're creating because it's so unhealthy. You know, one, one of the things I love about sort of the younger workforce um, that's that's upon us right now, for all the for all the things that us us more seasoned people like to say about uh, about work ethic and whatnot, one of the things that I absolutely um, applaud them for is their courage, because um, they will call BS on a on a culture or a situation that does not work for them, and they will have the courage to actually do something about it. And while when you're managing those people, it can be very exhausting <laughs> because you're like, seriously, can't you just go get along and go along? They won't let us off the hook on it, and I fundamentally believe it will make in corporate America stronger, but but there's a lot of adjusting that has to happen to accept that dynamic and applaud it. And I would tell all of the all of the young folks who worked for me who wanted to raise every other day and promoted every third day and all that stuff. Um, I would tell them, I want to tell you what I admire about you because you have more courage. Because listen, when I was your age, I also wanted to be promoted three days earlier, and I also wanted a bigger paycheck, and I wanted all those things, and I didn't want to move, and I didn't want to travel, and blah blah blah. I just never asked for it. And um, so I, I applaud you in that you asked for it. The frequency with which you ask, we might adjust a little bit. <laughs> right? But but your right to define your own path to happiness is fair and courageous. And I, I always, I mean, I used that that discussion many, many a time with younger people in my organization. So you, I, that's interesting that you said you felt very insecure when you were at your your pinnacle of your career. And yet others were looking to you to be the leader and you're, you know, watching to make sure you're not getting a knife in your back. I'm, you know, people need to know that you have a beautiful family. I'm assuming that kept you grounded. What else kept you grounded through that? Um, I would say, quite honestly, my network. You know, um, Fawn, when you and I met, actually, was when I was living in Florida. It was, I don't know, my fourth or fifth state that we'd moved to. Um, I've moved my family a lot. Um, I'm not, I'm not, um, I don't regret those choices, but you know, there's implications and repercussions for some of those decisions that one makes. Right. Um, but, but when I moved to Florida, I very intentionally decided that was the first time with intention. I said, I am going to build a network external to my company because while my network inside my company may be very strong, it is a one, it, one dimensional and it can only coach me and mentor me in the, in the aspect of that culture. And that was the first time that I was um, a leader, but I was solely the leader, meaning I went into that role and I was the boss of that whole place. And I had no peer there, right? When I'd been in the headquarter location, while I might have been accelerating in my career, I had peers the whole time. But all of a sudden you move into a role where you are it. And I don't mean that egotistically, it just is hierarchically how it worked. And you have no peer to talk to. And I wasn't particularly welcomed in that role because um, I was the first woman to ever run a part of the South. And there was a whole thing about how the South felt about having women there. And um, some of the things that were said to me are shocking. <laughs> um, and some of them I may relate, depending on how we go here, but I mean, shocking, utterly, like jaw drop, shocking. Yeah, we um, want to hear those. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so I didn't even have anybody nearby that I could reach out to who was a peer because they didn't really want me in that job. And so that was my decision to build an external network. And I had no idea then uh, when my star was still shiny and bright um, that I, how much I would need that network later mm. to coach and counsel and guide and help me be true to me. Wow. So, okay. So you're going to have to tell us those nasty things and then tell us the story how that came out came to play well i'll give you a couple of the nasties um i mean these are politically insensitive and i do i want to just put out a little disclaimer that these do not reflect my opinions on anything blah, 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 blah. like like they're they're outrageously outrageous statements but they were made to me and factually right um at points in my career so for example one of them was and i apologize to anyone i offend again this is not my personal view um, one of them was, if we have to hire women, can we only hire lesbians because they don't take maternity leave, for example? Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. 
What do you even say um, to that? <laughs> Let me I, talk to I, my I, lawyer. <laughs> right. I, oh my I, I, I literally was like, I am going to pretend as if that statement were not made to me. Um, another was um, we had a remote location in a particular assignment I was in and, um, and a, a superior to me said to me, have you been to that location yet? And I said, no, I haven't gotten there. It's on my agenda in the next two months or whatever it was. And um, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here because it's that offensive. Um, but the statement was, oh, I can't wait till you go up there. They um, don't allow people of different races. I'm going to say that's my insertion. Um, and they don't tolerate them there. I can't imagine they will be with a woman. Wow. <laughs> so, so some leadership jobs are lonely because what do you do with that? Right? What, what do you do there? with that? What did you say? My response was, um, I, 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 we need to call a timeout in this conversation because it was not a private conversation. There were other people involved. And I was like, we need to call a timeout. No, no, no part of that was appropriate, nor will I tolerate any part of it. I have no intimidation about going to see that site. I'm quite certain it will be fine. But everything you just said is out of bounds. For you. And, but, but you, know, you sit in that moment and you debate, like, should I get up and walk out? Should I make a scene? Should I make sure everybody knows that I'm saying this is not okay? Like, how do you... Were they senior to you? Uh, no, it, the, the person who said it was senior to me, but the rest of the people were junior to me. And so you feel a real burden of leadership. And how right. do I handle this? And what my actions are going to speak volumes. What do I do? Right. I mean, everybody thinks, right? I mean, having been in situations as well, you sit and you look at it on paper, you hear someone's story and you're like, oh, I would say something, you know, like, oh, I would. And you find yourself in this moment and it's, I don't know if it's this unexpected, I don't know if it's spirit, but you're, you start having that internal battle of what do I do? And then whatever it is you do, you're thinking about it for the next, for year. I mean, you know, you may come back on it. You may revisit it. You may make a, make a formal complaint, but it's just, it's, it's a whole lot different when you're in that moment than it is. Well, without without going into every gory detail, I will tell you, I mean, I was really shaken by that. Mm -hmm. And um, I did make a phone call the next day to a sponsor and said, this is not okay. And people need to be aware that this is mm -hmm. happening. Right. And, and there was, there was a bevy of other issues. I mean, I can, sure. we could fill this whole, this whole conversation yes. with just this yes. situation. Um, but I was like, it's not okay. And I will tell you all hell broke loose. Um, because the sponsor I called wanted to go deeper, which is what I expected they would want to do. And that's why I made the phone call. But the layers in between got their feathers all ruffled up. Why did you make this phone call? What did you do? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, what I, and I mean, I, I remember that day vividly. I remember being in the carpool line, trying to drop my kids off and all this pandemonium is breaking out. I can remember. Just a troublemaker. Uh, right. That's exactly. Honest to God, that's exactly right. That was the, the tag at that point, your troublemaker. And that tag stopped, quite frankly, for a while. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was I was shaken. I was like, I'm just doing what I think is the right thing to do. And that any organization should be happy to have brought forward to them if it's not representative of who we are. Um, and I would make that same call. But what I would tell you today is I was unequivocal about making that phone call because I had had enough experiences earlier in my career where my metal was tested and I didn't know for sure what I was made of until I was called to bear to task on it. And um, I'd had a couple of really difficult situations, but I learned very early that when you have a voice, you have to use it. When something is really awry and when something doesn't match, look at, if you just don't like your peer too bad, grow up. But, but if there's something either um, ethically or morally or principally wrong with the situation and you have a voice and you don't use it. I, I learned that any place I would want to be would want to hear that voice. And I was very supported through very difficult situations in my career that allowed me to feel like I knew what I had to do. And this is where your story really is so important to others because it all hinges on the same thing. When you see an injustice and you speak up you get that troublemaker label i've had it it is really hard to overcome it but you not only went out there you went way out there so what can you tell us about 
your story and how integrity and truth has guided you through some really dangerous, professionally dangerous territory. Um, so I'm going to go a couple places with this. I'm going to tell a couple of stories because I think they all pertain to your question. Um, I alluded earlier to sort of having a couple of rocky things happen early in my career. And, and I'll go into one story quickly, um, only because I think it sets the tone and, and kind of pulls back the veil on what I'm talking about when I'm talking in nebulous terms. So um, I had a situation in my career where it was unquestionably, <laughs> unquestionably sexual harassment. And um, there were lots of crazy things that happened. But one of them was um, we had a 360 survey on our on our supervisor. And I did that survey and I literally, this is embarrassing, but I, I truly went to the office and I cut with scissors my answers off. I typed them, I cut them with scissors and I taped them onto a form, which I then photocopied to send in to make sure that it was completely not traceable to me. Um, I was very worried that there'd be some way this could be traced. By the way, I still have that form. Um, you got to explain this because a lot of people don't experience 360s in, in what they're doing. So what it is, and what this cut and paste actually meant. So so this was actually a survey about my direct supervisor. And it asked all kinds of questions about, you know, how they how they were as an employee and as a boss. And this particular person was terrible as a human, let alone as an employee, as a boss. Um, this was a person who, like my job at the time entailed turning on lights and computer in the morning so that his boss, if they walked by, wouldn't know that he wasn't in the office yet. Um, this job required um, people to switch driving because this person had their license suspended for a DUI and they weren't allowed to drive. So we all had to drive this person to various locations as part of our job duties. Um, the, I mean, the stories just could go on and on. But but so when I had an opportunity to say this isn't quite right, I took it, but it was an anonymous opportunity. So you're supposed to go in and fill out your little survey and email it in. We, had, we didn't even have email at the time, but anyway, that, that was the idea. You're supposed to electronically submit it. And I was so worried that that what I said, because I was honest, would come back to haunt me, that I went through this whole machination of like, like using scotch tape and cutting out with scissors and making like a little, you know, art project um, as an adult um, to send in. And three days later, said supervisor was standing in my cube saying, why did you say these things about me with a copy of my document? And, you know, <laughs> your heart's beating pretty darn fast at that point. And said supervisor said, if you don't go out to the movies with me tonight, I will give you a low performance rating and I will get you fired. So when I tell you that this was like sexual harassment, I mean, like it was like, a, you know, I, it was not oh um, I was I was not abused in any way. But mentally, I mean, this is real. It was bad. Yeah. And I didn't say anything. Now, um, I didn't say anything. Several years later, um, this person um, was about to be promoted. And somebody who had observed everything that was happening out there was like, hey, before this person gets promoted, someone needs to talk to Trish. And I got the call. And I had to go in and talk to somebody who at that point in my career seemed like God. They were so senior, right? <laughs> like, I mean, like, um, and I I went in and I'm I'm like, now that you're asking, I'm gonna tell you everything. And I did. And a lot of craziness ensued. I will not bore you all with those details, but like a lot of craziness. Like I had a security de security council and I had weapons like a mace and a billy club and all this other stuff. I mean, it was it was crazy. Um, because they thought he was going to come after you. Wow. Yeah. Or yeah, they my, were so that well, at least they were wondering about him, because what I fear is, again, the person who says something is still the one. Who is ostracized? Yes, one hundred percent. And, and yeah. so, yeah, and, and I do want to go on the record on this one. I mean, people can probably figure out what I'm talking about anyway. But um, I, this was when I was still at Procter and Gamble, and the company's response was amazing. Um, it was un, unequivocally amazing. This was way before you know there was a movement to sort of mm -hmm. have a conversation about this kind of stuff, and. Um, I felt extremely well taken care of um, coming out of that experience. And I, I give massive kudos to the leadership there who um, took very serious action and just said, no mas, like we're not going to do this. But but through that whole process, I learned to find my voice in a way that I didn't know I knew how to do it. But I was like, if I don't do it, there will be someone else who comes after me who will have the same experience. And that is what I'm not okay with. And quite frankly, in hindsight, I'm so fortunate that that happened to me early because it mm -hmm. taught me who I am 
very early. Several years later, different situation altogether. Okay, wait, let me, let me, I can't move from that yet though. (laughs) Okay. Because we don't know what happened when he said, why'd you do this? What'd you say? I didn't, or what'd you say? I, I mean, I just said, I was just trying to be honest. That was my experience. I mean, what could I say? I mean, what could I say? Like, and then when he said, you got to go to the movies with me or I'm going to fire you, what'd you do? Um, a, a number of my mentors who were close to that situation, I mean, they literally were in my cube in one second flat. Like they they just, it just shut down and then, and and did not leave me in a position in which I could ever be that in that situation again from that day forward i mean they were, were they were around him um lost, like were you able to oh, separate from him? no 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 like that situation probably went on for another i don't know i don't really remember but probably another six months or so um until i moved on to my next assignment okay yeah, next yeah. Story. And, i mean okay. yeah okay so i there's more to that story but we're gonna pass that one and move on to this one so totally different situation completely different set of constituents blah 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 and there was a situation where my boss was accused of fraudulently expensing things on the company's books. And I was in finance still at the time. And my team is who found it and they brought it to me. So I have to act, right? I have to act. This is leadership. I mean, I have to act. And I will never forget, like, I mean, I can remember sitting in this meeting and my heart is like pounding through my chest, pounding. And I say in the leadership team meeting, uh, which all my peers are in and the boss is leading, you know, this situation has been brought to light. It did not name names, but I said, this situation has been brought to my attention. Um, you know who you are, and I will allow this to kind of move on. Let's move on this, provided you provide me a check by the end of the day um, for this amount. I want it on my desk by the end of the day today. And if it's not there, I'm going to have to take action. And just know that we are watching the expense reports closely, and this isn't going to be tolerated. And um, as you can imagine, all hell broke loose. <laughs> um, he was also in my office, not happy with me at all um, for accusing him and also I'm like I'm not I didn't accuse anybody I didn't even use a name right I didn't even use a name anyway so if I said to say a massive investigation ensued um I can remember at one point the auditor is calling me and saying you know you are implicated as well at this point we don't know that you're not part of the whole thing and I was like investigate away like look at whatever you want to look at and if in that process I can still look myself in the face every morning and say yeah we're good I don't particularly care what you think. I mean, but I'd already been through this other experience, right? Um, long story short, that gentleman's tenure was very short-lived at the company. <laughs> um, and we had a new, you know, a new boss come in who was fantastic, incredibly supportive, and became a sponsor for me, um, a really important sponsor. And um, life moved on. But these experiences as you're going through them, and then then we had the gem that I already told you about, you know, with the whole, you know other comments I shared, the the jaw droppers, Um, all of these experiences, they accumulate and they help you really understand. Yeah, I know I it's I draw the line here and I would rather not work here than work here with this set of circumstances. Right. Um, But but you're exactly right. I mean, troublemaker for sure. Um, Can't just go along and get along at one point, um, you know, in the in the in the situation that ultimately ended in my termination. Um, I had somebody say to me, somebody was very close to me say, can't you just let it go? And I was like, I cannot, I cannot. <laughs> and, and he was like, it's in your best interest to let it go. And I'm like, it depends on what you define as my best interest. Right. But, but had I not had all of those other situations, I don't know if I would have felt as, it would have been as clear minded about that later. So what can you tell us about that story? Uh, what I can tell you is, you know, again, not unique to any particular company, but um, diversity was a challenge and diversity at senior levels was a challenge. And and that's something that was very personal to me because because um, <laughs> I happen to be diverse. Right. Um, and so so as we were working through that and talking about it, um, I am a very data oriented person. I went in a lot of directions. I started in finance. I went and did all kinds of other things, but that is still my hip pocket skill. That is where I go to for comfort when I don't know what else to look at. I look at the data. And so I pulled a bunch of data from my own organization. And what I found was um, that we had some serious issues around how we were compensating people. And um, I felt like that was very related to our diversity issues. And I became pretty vocal about it. And that was not very popular. <laughs> um, and, and, and by the way, it was also a bit about me. 
So I feel like I can talk about that fairly openly because we had a situation where there was a leadership transition and um, someone else got a job that I was a contender for. That happens. No one, you're not happy when it happens, but I didn't really expect that I was going to get that job. Um, but the organization got very um, anxious about me and what my reaction might be, right? So I was getting calls from all over the place about how I was doing and how I felt and what my career looked like. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not, I'm not thrilled. I'm not jumping for joy, but like, I'm okay. It happens. I'm a big girl. Um, and I was making a pretty good living. So like if life goes on, right. But in the process of that whole thing happening, I had been directly told um, that I was underpaid relative to my peers significantly. And that there was um, a commitment through this process that I was to be kind of topped up so that I was, more equitably compensated. And so this whole conversation really started with me. And it was very personal because I was like, I'm not even going to bring the rest of the world into this yet because I can talk one on one. And, and no one can tell me I can't talk one on one. This is my life and my livelihood. So I started asking questions about that, um, about can you and, and I was asked all the time, what do you want? What do you want? And all I could say is if you can look me in the eye and tell me I'm fairly compensated relative to my peers, I am comfortable. But if you can't do that, then I expect it to be made right. And um, that was an extremely unpopular <laughs> conversation line, extremely unpopular. And, and once I started meeting resistance there, that's when I started to look a little deeper and understand where else this might go. And I was extremely, I, I was jarred by what I learned. I was, I was stunned by what I learned. And I felt like um, this is something that we should be working on as a company because it's an important issue. And um, that didn't really go so well for me. <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out how to is there any more you can tell us about that i mean ultimately all i will say is um you know up until that point it, this is factual um i had been considered high potential in the company um i had been i had a very close relationship uh, with our most senior leadership uh, personally and um i felt like i had a lot of sponsorship and literally through this period of time my talent call was changed from high potential uh, for the first time ever in my career, even though our business results were better than they had ever been in the past decade. Um, and things that I had been typically invited to or part of, I was uninvited to um, and I was excluded from. So the messaging was pretty clear. You're now on the outs, you know, on the outs. And, you've, and I mean, I felt it. Believe me, I felt it. How did that um, feel? I'm just going to ask that too, like, how does that's rejection and shunned and exclusion? It, it felt, it felt awful. I mean, it felt really awful. And probably the hardest part of that is you can't show anyone on your team, right? Because that's leadership. So you have to walk in every day as strong and as clear-minded and as ready to do business as you've ever been. And you, the last thing you want is your team to know this is happening because if you don't have support, they don't have support, mm -hmm. right? And I can't, I, my sponsorship is meaningless to people if I don't have any, any political capital left, right? So, I mean, I felt very un, unempowered. I felt very ostracized um, and I felt very, very lonely. And, you know, the truth is I should have left then, but I'm a fighter. And by nature, sometimes to my own detriment, obviously, in this back. case, to, to my own detriment. Back, right? Yeah. And, um, and I wasn't going to let it go. And um, so in truth, while being fired was the most humiliating experience to ever happen to me, um, it wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me, if that makes sense. Right. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it forced me to play my hand and to get on with my life. Um, and I am infinitely more content today than I was then, infinitely. And, and friends who know me for years and years and years, I'll say, oh my God, like talking to you, you're a totally different person. Um, and I think that's true. Um, but in the process of it, it was completely debilitating. You know, I, I did my spell being persona non grata and it's embarrassing. It's humiliating and you've done nothing wrong that's that's the worst of it is you're the one in the right 
and you are being painted as this outcast reject and and your career is the one that has to suffer for that and that is painful and you it is you really and I, I wish people knew every detail of what you did but you really were a champion for everyone and you did it boldly and cleverly but you got eaten by the mama you know i mean the the company and um in the end though you kind of won i think so i think um you know i've told fun i know i've told you the story but in the very end there was a very 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 lonely night for me when i finally had to stop all the voices and including my husband and my best friends and every counsel I had, and I had to lock myself in a room and come to terms with what I wanted to do next and how I wanted to handle the options on the table for me. And that was a brutal night. Um, but, and, and I still sometimes wonder if I made those the right choices. Um, but listen, one of the things that was very real to me um, was this is how, this is my fiber and my fabric, but the people closest to me, my family didn't choose to be married to the crusader, right? Or to be sons to the crusader. They didn't opt for that. And I had to actually force myself to think about what happens in this course or this course and who suffers. And I felt like the suffering that the people I loved the most would have to endure was too great. But uh, but some we we also found some ways to make improvements that I hope still stick and still matter and open conversations that had to be opened um, for the better. And I believe that fundamentally I, that 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 this whole experience began a dialogue that needed to be had, um, and and hopefully really did make some things better. Now. I want to tell you, as lonely and awful and horrible as all that was, blah, blah, blah. And it was all those things. So I sat down with my two sons, who are now 18 and 20, and said, listen, I want you to know what really happened at that chapter. And what really happened is I was fired. And they were like jaws on the table. Like, wait, what? <laughs> right? Because all they had ever seen was sort of this upward trajectory, this momentum, and this, quite frankly, special treatment that I had gotten up until then. And all of a sudden, you know, for them to hear as sort of young adults, like, wait, what happened? Um, but I felt like it was so important to them to understand, like, you will trip and you may fall. And that that's not even that interesting. What's really interesting is do how long does it take you to get up? And what are you going to take with you? Um, so I hope that sticks with them. I hope they don't ever go through what I went through. But if they do, I think it's helpful to know that someone that you have sort of looked up to, I mean, they're both now in business school and they will call me and interview me for things and all stuff all the time. And it's really flattering and it's lovely, but, but someone that they, you know, saw in a certain way in business can come clean and say, yeah, this is what happened to me. And that's kind of interesting, but look what happened after that. And I know other people in that company who have other difficult stories. Um, I do wonder as you look at that, like how hard was that, like that day when you find out you've been fired? I, mean, I, just, I just can't even imagine because really, I, I saw you going all the way, Fortune 50 most powerful women. You know, you were going to be one of the CEOs. There was just no doubt in my mind, which still could happen if you want that. But I think that this really clarified your priorities in a different direction. It, it really did. And I'm going to tell a really quick, funny story about that. So one of the you know special events that kind of happens sometimes was um, a small group, a very small group of people would be invited very mysteriously um, to show up at a certain place at a certain time for two days. And there was no agenda provided. There was no nothing. It was just going to be this small group. And you didn't know who else was invited, um, spending time with the CEO. And so we got the, the when I got to that event, um, you know, I'm super nosy. So I'm like leaning over like the blotter of the hotel, like, so did so-and-so check in yet? And of course the guy's <laughs> like, oh, no, ma'am, you know, like, and, and so you, cause you didn't know who's going to be there. So anyway, I show up to the first like event and, um, we're all just kind of sitting around this fire 
And the CEO says, you know, I, I really just want to spend time getting to know you all a bit more intimately because one of you will be my successor one day. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish here. So Trish, why don't you begin and tell us your story? This is literally what happened. And I was like, tell you my story. Like, what does that mean from birth to like now? Like, I, I don't even know what it's going to do here. So anyway, so I proceed to sort of tell my story. And at the end of the story, this, the CEO says to me, um, so when you're all done with your career, what do you want to be when you're at the end? And I took a very deep breath and I said, I want to be a CEO. And the whole room, you could feel the whole room like rolling their eyes and like, oh my God, here she goes, right? But I was like, if I don't have the courage to say it in this room with my competitor seated next to me, I don't have the right to aspire to it. So here you go. And said CEO says to me, you know, you can say it out loud. And I said, I just did. And they said, so you want my job? And I said, oh, I didn't say your job. That may or may not be in the cards, but I want that job because I think I can. And um, it was a really, that's awesome, really difficult moment for me, right? Awesome. But but that that was my aspiration. And you know, <laughs> along the way, I found out I still think I can, quite frankly. And I don't mean that arrogantly. I just think I can. But I'm in an environment today where I go to work every day. I have unquestionable impact, tremendous support. Um, I feel valued. I've been told I'm valued continuously. And I have tremendous autonomy. And all of a sudden, I'm like, forget that. Who needs those three ty- those three letters? I have right. everything I ever wanted here. It just took me a long time to get here. And by the way, had I not taken the path I had taken through very large companies and then went and did the small company stuff, I wouldn't have been a candidate for this job. And I wouldn't be successful in this job. So I really do think all things have their purpose. But man, I'm not telling you I'd live that same story again if I was given a chance. I don't know if I would. Boy, that is an incredible story. How many people were in the room there? Uh, There were 15 of me and then the CEO. That's it. That is is an amazing story. And I think that's one thing. Women are not programmed to say that out loud, Mm -hmm. especially women. To say awesome. I, I want to be the CEO. That, By the way, the next I, 14 people who followed me all said things like, I just want to make a difference here. Or I just want to like, you know, lead people to their promise or whatever. And I was like, I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> 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 what I wanted to say was like, you should disqualify all of them because they have no gumption, right? <laughs> but like, well, don't whatever. you think that that may have disqualified them? If I had been in that CEO chair, for sure I would have, right? And knowing that person the way I know them, I have to imagine the answer is yes. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, you know, I know right now we have gone really long, and listeners, thanks for hanging in there with us because the story has been. Michelle, aren't you just blown away by her? There's so many things I'm thinking about, so many questions I want to ask. I know I'm like, I was texting Vaughn, I'm like, oh. What do we do? It's well, love. I it's think she is so on a thing. women's leadership network event. I know. So we can continue the conversation. But Trish, just the idea and, and you know, the hard one wisdom from this really is know your center, honor your truth, have faith in the process. You get where you need to go. Maybe not on the path you're expecting. But the one thing that we know for you is that when you get up in the morning, and you look in the mirror, you can live with that person mm-hmm. 100%. And your kids can be proud of that person. And I have had a lot of people tell me they've had to do things that they're not proud of. But it's really great to see someone that has done so well and is such a giver to other people and done it while keeping her integrity and her truth. So thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today. We love you. Thank yes. You. Thank, thank you, ladies, from the bottom of my heart. It's always a pleasure. And thank you for doing what you're doing to give us all more wisdom. Thank you for joining the Hard One Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator Michelle Brigman. Join us weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Visit hardwonewisdom.com for more on this podcast.
and for links to Fawn and Michelle's web pages and social media. Also, be sure to rate, subscribe, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort, and we'll see you next week.